We are offering American Sign Language interpretation and closed captioning for today's webinar. To access the American Sign Language interpreter, you will need to look for their thumbnail and then you will need to pin it. They are listed as ASL interpreter and then their name. And today we have Alberto Sosa. Thank you, Alberto. To access the closed captioning feature, you should look at the bottom left corner of your screen. And there you will find a box with the little letter CC inside. You want to click on that. You will then see the closed captioning begin. Additionally, you can click the arrow next to this box to select your preferred captioning language. We are also using the Q&A application for this webinar. During the presentation, you can submit questions using this app. To find this app, you should look at the bottom right corner of your screen. Your questions will not be visible to other attendees, but will be received by panelists. We will address as many questions as time allows. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the OPWDD website. Now I will hand things over to Deputy Commissioner Kate Marlay. She is with the Division of Policy and Program Development. Kate. Okay, well, welcome everybody. We really appreciate your uh, joining us um, at this, the hallowed end of the Appendix K um, and COVID. So something I long looked forward to having in the rear view mirror. So what we want to do today is um, just to do a quick walkthrough on four ADMs that were recently updated to reflect the end of Appendix K coverage, walk through what those um, changes are at a high level um, and really focusing on sort of the critical next steps and substantive changes to the ADM. So the next two slides are just an overview and a chart. Um, this is online um, as well, so you can look at a version of this online if it's helpful. What it does is just outline the content areas um, that are being updated for each of the four ADMs. So on this chart, you see that we have ADM 0601. Um, that is our group day have service documentation requirements. So this is an old one, goes back quite some time. Um, and there are updates to the ADM to reflect the end of in-residence uh, day habilitation. Um, but because of its age, you will see that there is um, pretty significant rewriting and updating simply for clarity rather than content. What we will focus on in this uh, presentation is what the content um, changes are versus sort of the, the general rewording that a document that's that old needs to have. So the next ADM we'll be talking about today is 21 ADM 02. It now will have an R after it. This is the ADM that discusses community have residential services delivered in the individual certified residence. So just to kind of level set, that ADM is about who can receive in residence services after November 11th and what the appropriate planning and preparation is for in residence services. The next ADM that we're going to be talking about is uh, 23 ADM 08. So this ADM will have a new number. Um, it replaces the billing ADM for community HAB um, that was originally published in 2015. Um, very simply, that's because that ADM initially did not allow in resident services, and now we allow it for a section of folks, a uh, subset of the people we serve. So that's being reflected in that ADM. Um, finally, we have the ADM that was also issued in 2021. Um, that governs the use of telehealth um, or remote service delivery for HCBS waiver services. So we'll be walking through a few of those changes as well. So before we get into the content of the ADM, I just wanted to make sure that folks understood and um, could access the resources that we have available um, to, uh, to guide providers in terms of preparing for the end of the PHE and subsequent end of the Appendix K coverage. So trip down memory lane on February 11th, uh, the HHS Secretary announced that the 
Um, there would be one last um, round of Appendix uh, K or a public health emergency, um, and it would end on May 11th. Uh, in April and August, and the links are here, we sent out detailed um, memoranda on uh, various topics related to sort of unpacking um, and get ready, getting ready for the end of the Appendix K coverage. Next slide. Um, those documents are available on um, the link that you see here, uh, which is a uh, Appendix K COVID-19 unwinding page on the OPWDD website. Uh, additional guidance um, that we're also going to reference here was sent out from the Central Operations um, site uh, by email to all providers regarding um, the billing guidance. So that's just sort of a list of resources for you. Uh, we will have the slides available to folks um, so that you can access uh, those links. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about ADM issuance and public comment. Um, so uh, these four ADMs that we're reviewing today will go into effect on November 11th. That's when the Appendix K coverage will end. Um, we are also simultaneously initiating a 30-day public comment period that will run through December 8th, 2023. Um, on this slide, you will see each of the links um, to the four ADMs that we, we, we will be reviewing today, so you can access those. And again, we will distribute these slides. Um, these are being issued as final because the authority under which uh, we're operating here, the Appendix K has ended, so the ADMs are final. Um, however, public comment is being adhered to and is in process now. Um, so we may, we will evaluate public comment for the next 30 days, and then we will evaluate uh, whether we need to reissue uh, the ADMs based on the comment received. So let's drill into the substance of each of these. Uh, the first ADM we're going to look at is our ADM for day habilitation, which will, now will have an R on the end. Um, the purpose and the billing standards have some substantive changes. Um, and you can see there on the purpose from page two, we describe those changes, uh, which is with the end of the Appendix K authority, Day have services can no longer be provided in IRAs, CRs, or family care homes. People who require in-resident services may qualify for Community Have R, in-residence Community Have R. And we link in this ADM to the appropriate ADM that describes the, um, the provision of Community Have R in residence for people who live there and need in-resident services. Um, similarly, on page four, a substantial change in the ADM is that when we talk about that time bill, so program day duration, for those of you who just love that terminology, that will not include time at the person's certified residence. Again, for the reason above, now we can do community have in certified residences for folks who need that. Um, there are other changes for clarity that I just want to point out. Um, reason being, it may be a little confusing to folks. Not all the changes that you're going to see underlined are necessarily substantive. So, for example, on this slide, page four from this ADM, you'll see that we have the billing standards. I already mentioned that time is the person's residence uh, is backed out of program day duration. That is obviously new. Um, the rest that you see underlined in red is just to clarify, is, is not really new or different. Um, it's just substantially reworded and relocated in the ADM. So, um, you know, that's just to, you know, just to make clear for folks, not every single change that is going to be highlighted on these is necessarily substantive. Uh, what we tried to highlight were all substantive changes and then any changes that were significant enough in terms of the layout or how it read um, that we wanted folks to, to understand that that had been changed, even if just for clarity's sake. So we're moving on at great speed, and now we're going to talk about service document, documentation for community have services. 
Uh, this ADM was all the way back in 2015, um, and it now will be reissued with a new number. So it'll be 23ADM08. Um, and again, out for public comment for you all to uh, review and comment upon. So the major changes here, the substance changes, as I mentioned before, um, is that it is updated to reflect the requirements of in-residence community HAVR. So we went through this 2015 ADM. We made sure that it reflected the new allowance that community HAVR could be de delivered within a certified residence for folks who qualify um, and need those in-residence services. That's further described on page three under the discussion exception, where we note that community have services cannot be delivered at a certified site as a general rule, um, but we do allow that that can occur in a residence for people that qualify for in-residence community have R, um, as described in the ADM um, 2021-02, um, R, which we will be reviewing uh, shortly. Uh, in that same ADM, um, billing limitations is going to read very differently. There are no other substantive changes. Uh, we also note on page nine, and I think this is sort of an important point for folks to understand um, how these four ADMs kind of interact. Uh, we did update the billing identifier section to say that um, the new language here, that both 2021-03 regarding the use of remote technology and ADM 2021-02 governing in-resident CHR services have both been updated with uh, the billing modifiers. So you won't see that here for community have if, if you are using um, if you're delivering in-resident services for community HAB or you're using remote technology, you'd have to go to the ADMs on those um, topics to get the billing identifiers. So our next ADM we wanted to review uh, is, uh, is near and dear to my heart. Uh, that is 21 ADM 2 r So that's another one of the ADMs that was recently issued. Um, and this is where we discuss the planning for and the requirements and the requirements that people are selecting to receive services in residence are described in this ADM. So the, the big change here, no surprise, is um, when you look at the ADM on page seven, um, it's just bolded here for emphasis on this slide. You wouldn't find it in the original ADM. Um, you will see that we say that you will need to identify claims in the claim system, um, but the modifier is under development. So what we've done in this ADM is we have inserted that information um, into the billing direction. So if you are using in resident CHR for a person, there are instructions um, that would uh, inform your folks who deliver claims how those can be identified in the claim system. So changes for clarity. Um, there were some changes for clarity in page um, and plain language on page two. Again, just in an interest for not having people worry about um, the, the former format of the document looking different than originally. Those are not content changes. And then finally, a clarification on page seven. Um, that a person may receive in resident services via telehealth and then how to build those. So um, you will see that as well. So um, remote technology and telehealth billing direction. So as folks will recall, we issued 2180M03 back in July of 2021. And at that point, we noted just like the previous ADM that the ADM will be updated and redistributed once the billing modifier is available in eMedney. So that's how we published it back in July of 2021. And now um, we add that, those directions um, for folks. So the language you're seeing here is highlighted and underlined in the draft or in the final ADM out for public comment. 
Um, and that just added the billing instruction that we noted in when it was first issued we would be providing. Next slide. Um, the, the additional substantive change um, is just really describing that a person may receive both um, and, and further explaining sort of the claiming methodology that one claim gets submitted in a day, but it doesn't limit someone from receiving, for example, an in-resident service via telehealth in the same day, or for that matter, receiving um, a face-to-face -face service and a telehealth service at different times during the day. Those would have to be rolled up, submitted once, um, following the instructions provided here. Um, so I just wanted to highlight here, um, on October 24th, a notice was sent to all providers. Um, this had the billing modifier information, so that was sent out from our central operations folks. Um, and it explains the uh, details of using telehealth. A similar memoranda was sent out on November 2nd um, that detailed the coding for in residence. So claim adjustment, I mean, understanding that timeframes are short to say the very least, uh, we just wanted to make clear that uh, if billing software is not prepared to uh, tag claims that are delivered via telehealth um, or in resident services, those can be adjusted afterwards. Um, and there is no difference in the payment rate, so it's, it's just a matter of making sure those claims are adjusted once the final um, changes are made to the billing software. But if I could at this point, um, I believe we have Earl Jefferson on the line. Earl, would you like to um, walk through the slide if we can get you unmuted? Yeah, sure, okay. can, can you guys hear me? Yes, thank you. Very good, yeah, so as Kate had mentioned, I think we, we realized that the uh, information going out to providers was was close to to the change and the end of the wind out of the, of the PHE. So for providers, and we've had discussions with software vendors who who are submitting claims for providers who are getting things in place, but we, we don't want this to cause any um, delay in providers submitting their claims. So if your you know your software vendors or your your billing software is not updated yet, you can still submit your claims as you are today. And then you'll be able to go back and adjust those claims down the road to include um, you know, the procedure codes and modifiers we're talking about today. The claim adjustments, essentially, I'm sure most providers are aware, um, it's just similar to adjusting a prior paid claim or, or claim voids that providers often do correct uh, billing errors. But essentially, you're, you're replacing a prior paid claim um, with with these identifiers on them, but you know there's no take back of funds. It's really just updating the information on the replacement claim to get the identifiers on there, so OPWDD is able to to tell you know the population that's getting services via these modalities. Certainly, our central operations email is on there, folks. You know we've been getting questions, but certainly email us if you have questions or concerns. Or need any assistance, and you know we're we're glad to help out as we can. Now, can you go back to slide twenty? So thank you, Earl. I appreciate that. Um, I did just want to go back um, to this slide. Yeah, that one. Um, with apologies, I did forget a very important notice here that I, I want to loop back to before we proceed with the deck. Um, this is a substantive change to the ADM for the use of telehealth. And if you look at the bottom of the slide there, we have a statement, all life plans must be updated to reflect the use of remote technology as soon as possible, but no later than April 11, 2024. So just so folks know, it was really my extreme oversight that I forgot to reference that and I wanted to make sure that people took note of it. So there is a bit of a glide path there for, um, you know, thinking through how um, technology do, will be used to work with people and making sure that's um, addressed in the uh, planning process for a person. So apologies for that oversight. And now if we can jump back. So um, we did want to make a special note for SEMP Pathway uh, to Employment and Community-Based Pre-Vocational Services. Um, Big difference in these services in that there has 
longstanding been use of technology um, to deliver these services and the concept of direct or indirect services. But with that, we have some experts on the line. Um, and I'm wondering, Alexis, if you would like to address the next couple of slides. Okay, great. Um, so, yes, as Kate mentioned, um, for SEMP, Pathway to Employment and Community Based Prevocational Services, there has really always been an allowance for remote services to be delivered. And this could be, you know, a phone call from the job coach, really working through some tasks that somebody is pursuing on the job. Um, so, we did just want to flag here that the requirements of this remote services. ADM applies to direct service delivery only. It does not apply to the services that are delivered on behalf of the person, um, otherwise known as indirect services. So if you are delivering um, remote services on behalf of the person, you're calling the business, you do not need a telehealth billing modifier for that delivery. And so, one other thing that we wanted to make sure we were covering is that the life plan documentation requirements are really only required along with the billing modifiers when um, you are utilizing that remote technology, two way, real time communication directly with the person. So, again, um, got ahead of myself with the example, but this would be a, a two way telephone call between a job coach and the person. That that is when the billing modifier is required and there will need to be, you know, within that glide path period, some information noted in the life plan itself that supports that this is being done. Um, we will have some additional conversations and training specific to SEMP pathways and community prevoke. Um, additional guidance will be coming, but we encourage you to utilize the public comment period on this ADM to share any any additional specific questions that you may have with us. Great, thank you, Alexis. So that um, brings us to the end of the formal presentation. Uh, we did just wanna give you a couple links uh, for follow-up on the content of the ADM changes. If you have questions about content, please send them um, to us. We'll certainly work with Alexis and her team um, to share any of uh, the questions that uh, pertain to their area of expertise. Um, billing questions, obviously you heard from Earl. Um, he's, he's a chief chef and um, dishwasher in, in all things billing. So thank you, Earl, and please feel free to use that central operations um, contact list. So with that, to get to questions today, um, and we wanted to make the most use of time that we possibly could, um, we ask that you, as Mel mentioned, um, put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, we're now gonna go offline for just a minute, um, assess some of the questions, and we'll address as many as we can uh, today. And thankfully, we have a, a group of experts on that can help us answer those. Um, and uh, of course, if we can't get to the entire group of questions today, uh, we will be collecting those and evaluating how to get back to folks. So uh, please make use of that box. So thank you, and we'll just pause for a minute while we assess the questions. There's several questions that we've gotten in a couple of times, so we definitely want to hit on those. Uh, the first is, is EVV, or electronic visit verification, required for community hab? So the short answer to this is that community hab and in-home respite are the two service types that are subject to EVV in the OPWDD system. That said, we do have a, we are investigating whether there is any um, exclusion to that um, based on certified residential locations. I don't think that is probably gonna come to fruition to be perfectly honest, but we will be getting back uh, to folks with questions about that. Um, EVV has been the rule of the land for, you know, several years now, um, and I would hope that, you know, providers that deliver community have and or in-home respite are gonna, um, you know, be up to snuff on what those requirements are. But, but we will do some more investigation and, and, and definitely confirm with folks. 
So we also had a question of what is the point of uh, unique identifiers of service that are delivered via uh, community has or via technology rather. Um, well, first of all, sort of writ large, um, the Medicaid system and Medicare are identifying claims that are delivered versus technology. I think it's important for us to know um, how what uptick there is and where it's helpful and where it isn't. Uh, more importantly, we have assurances to the federal government that it is not the only modality that people are receiving services through. So what they don't want is that people get isolated because they're receiving techno technological um, delivery of services rather than in person. Um, so that's a reason that we have to identify that in the claim stream, even if there is no payment differential between um, you know, time that is delivering a service via technology or time that is uh, delivering service in a uh, in-person manner. So there's been a number of questions about um, day have and uh, delivery of in-resident services in, for example, um, you know, when there's snow outside, um, when weather conditions would prohibit uh, travel. A couple things I just want to mention there. One. Uh, rates are adjusted to reflect um, non-service days. So all rates have been sort of built up to reflect that um, maybe not all costs can be captured um, due to less than, you know, five days a week, 52 weeks a year service delivery. So that adjustment is made. Um, people are welcome to comment, um, but that's, uh, at this point, that is the answer. If people need in-resident services, uh, they can be registered for in-residence community have R if they're appropriate for it and they choose that service modality. Um, and people can be enrolled in multiple programs. There's a, a question here as well regarding day have, whether the billing rules are changing regarding uh, counting time that is delivered at lunch. Um, as folks know, that has always been since 2006, something that we have backed out of service delivery time. Um, except uh, during the COVID emergency. That is not changing in this ADM. Again, it is out for public comment and people should feel free um, to su submit comments if they care to, but you're not going to see at this point that that is reflected in the ADM. So there was a question about the 51% rule and the provision of uh, in-resident services. So that was really, I think, targeted to day habilitation. So that memoranda is now replaced in essence, um, and we will update the uh, ADM if that's needed. So folks should feel free to comment. Um, I just wanted to address briefly kind of overall sort of the programmatic um, point of that question. And that is, and it's really related to in residence community have R, is that, um, it's in everyone's best interest that the degree to which, even if you choose to and are appropriate for in residence day services, which we're now delivering through community have are, that there is as much community integration um, and you know involvement in the in your neighborhood, your community um, as uh, the person wants and can manage. So that is absolutely still an expectation that there is careful planning about how the provision of in-residence community have are is not isolating. Uh, that's a very important concept um, federally and certainly I think for all of us it would be, uh, you know, what we would hope for for folks. So good question and thank you. So the question is, uh, can services be uh, delivered um, if the life plan has yet to be um, um, documented, is, is not yet documenting the use of uh, telehealth. So let's just step back and make sure we understand what we're talking about. So what we're talking about is a person who wants to use telehealth to receive, you know, for example, uh, day habilitation, just as an example. Um, what would need to happen is that there is a discussion in the clear planning um, team about whether the person wants this, how it's appropriate, et cetera. Um, we have the ADM on that for uh, remote technology that needs to be followed. Um, if, as long as the person's life plan 
has day habilitation in it. There needs to be no interruption of services because you don't yet have that, haven't had a chance to have the conversation. So if the person has agreed to the remote service delivery, it's been happening, they're okay with it happening, go ahead and continue to deliver it, but do make sure that that sort of purposeful conversation happens about the life plan and it is documented there um, you know, prior to the April 11th date. We have a couple sent questions that I think we'd like you to address, if you don't mind. Jim, do you want to read it? Yeah, sure. I'll, this is Jim Kaufman. I'll, I'll read this particular question. Phone calls are provided on an ongoing basis to provide some services per the ADM. The care manager must complete an evaluation every six months for those Utilizing remote services, this will be a very onerous task since virtually all STEMP participants receive remote services. What are the implications for STEMP provider if the care manager fails to meet the six-month evaluation requirement? Will OPWDD consider an exclusion or alternative method for STEMP? So I'll let Alexis answer that question, you know, and or clarify, you know, per some of the comments she already provided in this presentation. Yeah, Jim, hi, this is Abiba. I'm going to jump in. Um, so I think that as we've noted at this particular point, um, the guidance around the use of the um, remote services for the direct um, service provisions of SEMP would apply. And that would mean that the requirements outlined in the remote services ADM around, you know, the care manager completing the evaluation tool in concert with the life plan, given the glide path that has been provided stands. Um, as we've noted, there is an opportunity for public comment. And so folks should certainly use um, that time period to provide any substantive comments that they wish so that we can consider. But I think at this particular point, the guidance that we have in place um, stands and to the extent that folks um, need information from CCOs um, and are not able to, to obtain that. You know, the CCOs certainly have um, resolution methods within the organization that should be adhered to. Um, and certainly regional field offices as well can be um, a source of contact if needed. Great, thank you, Aviva. And I just, this is Kate, I just wanna um, clarify for folks because I think it's important to understand that the language that's reflected in the um, uh, 21 ADM 03R, which is the telehealth ADM, very much mirrors, uh, it's in a bit more detail, but it does mirror the waiver application that was submitted and approved in July of 2021. So while um, I'm sure Abiba and staff will work hard to um, you know, help providers through this transition, um, it, just want to make sure that folks are aware that this is indeed uh, part of the waiver description for um, all services that are allowed to use telehealth. There is another question on whether the billing rules have changed in terms of two and four hours. No, that is not changing. So it's really the same rules. Um, when you look at that ADM, it's going to look different. Please remember for DAHAB, that went back to 06. So we use very different language today than we did in those decks. So it may look different, but from a, you know, whether that's a substantive change, I think you will find it is not a substantive change. So this, the, there was a question about PHP and whether they are ready to accept those claims. It does apply to PHP, so it is system-wide. These are requirements for the whole waiver. And we certainly will be engaging with them to make sure that, um, that they are ready to accept uh, the new modifiers. So there's a question here, which Abiba, I'm afraid I'm going to punt to you. Um, and that is uh, a meeting participant noted that there are, there may be delays in a care manager receiving approval for a service. And if that is delayed, um, can a provider um, back bill if they proceed with service provision? Kate, I just, I, I want to take that back because I want to make sure I understand the question. Is this related to service authorization for supported employment or um, community-based pre-voc? I'm not sure I sure. understand the 
No, 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 that's fair. So what I will do, Abiba, thank you for that. Um, the person who submitted that question, if you could type some clarification into the Q and A, um, then I think we'll have to uh, get back to you on that so that you know we have time to digest and understand what the uh, what the question in particular is addressing. Thank you. Okay, so we are um, we are at time. Um, I think what I would like to do is we'll give everybody another minute. If there's anything that we have not addressed, uh, please enter it into the Q&A so we can get back to you. Just a couple um, items that I wanted to clarify. So folks, um, the uh, contact information are on these slides as some valuable links, I hope. Uh, we will be sending the slide deck out, so that will be available to you. We will be posting a recording. It's going to take us a couple days to get that up but it will be available uh, early next week. Um, and we'll send a uh, note out to participants when that is available. Um, so with that, I just want to thank everyone very much for your participation today. I know it was a, a, a short order request, so we really appreciate your participation. Um, and we look forward to uh, working with you um, in a whole new world where we do not have uh, the Appendix K authority, which, you know, frankly, I'm going to miss a little. But uh, thank you, everybody, and have a great weekend.